welcome everyone to another installment of Gardens and Grub here in the fine city of Durham. Uh, I'm Sherilyn Berry, your extension agent in Durham County, Family and Consumer Sciences, and we talk all about seed to table food. Um, today we're going to talk about beans. Um, if you, We're going to talk for about 20 minutes and then if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand in Zoom or, or type in the chat box or uh, message us on Facebook. So why don't we get started with beans in general? I have got a whole bunch of beans to look at and they're from different species. Um, a lot of these you've had before, some of them maybe you haven't seen before, but they're all delicious and they're all good for you. So beans are um, one of the oldest cultivated crops in the world. Um, in ancient Egypt, you would find beans actually put into tombs um, and burial grounds. Um, they're a great source of protein because you know previously the last couple weeks we've talked about other legumes, first peas, then peanuts, and now we're talking about beans. Um, they're rich in protein because this is where we get our nitrogen groups. And that's because of the rhizobia, these little bacteria that live in the roots of bean plants or legumes in general, and they trap atmospheric nitrogen because there's nitrogen, about 15% of what we breathe in is nitrogen gas. And these rhizobia trap it and feed it to the plant because the plant needs nitrogen in order to make green leaves. Um, it's a big source of, of, um, of, it's a nutrient that's necessary for all plants to survive. It's also necessary for us to survive. So the reason that um, beans are rich in protein is because those rhizobia trap the atmosphere in nitrogen, feed it to the plant, and the plant in turn uh, feeds starch and sugars to the rhizobia. So it's a symbiotic relationship, an interdependent relationship. Um, so beans are have that same relationship. Uh, bean plants have, have it, peanuts have it, um, peas have it, uh, mesquite trees have it, um, lots of clover, um, all the beautiful little clovers that bees uh, love the little flowers of, those also have it. And so if you grow these type of plants, they're very, very rich in nitrogen and you don't have to fertilize them much. And if you chop them up and put them in your compost pile or let them just kind of die on the surface of the soil, um, the soil bacteria will break them down and feed your soil and other plants that are going to grow there afterwards. It's like free nitrogen. It's free fertilizer, um, also called like a green manure if you grow a legume um, in, in your landscape. So um, beans are some of the oldest cultivated crops, as we said. They're rich in protein. They are also rich in fiber. So they do a couple of really wonderful things. Um, they reduce our blood cholesterol because when we eat really high fiber things, um, it keeps us regular. Um, but it also, um, when you have fiber in your digestive tract, um, you have blood flowing right next to your digestive tract and it is um, releasing toxins and, and um, releasing all sorts of uh, waste products from your your, your um, biochemical processes. And it's also pulling in um, nutrients. So there's this exchange that happens with your, um, your, your uh, circulatory system all around your intestines. And so if there's a lot of fiber in your intestines and you have LDL, which is your bad type of cholesterol flowing around in your blood, um, your blood is actually better able to release it for waste products um, if you have a high fiber diet. And beans are wonderful, nutrient rich, um, high fiber protein that you can eat um, that will actually help you um, with um, you know, your blood pressure, your, your uh, reduces cardiovascular disease, chances of stroke, um, chances of heart attack. So high fiber in general, great thing to have. You need at least 25 grams of fiber a day. So um, 25 to 28. And beans are a great source. So beans are rich in nitrogen, but they don't have all of the essential amino acids that your body needs to survive. So and those are the building blocks of blocks of protein. So if you eat a bean, with a grain like peanut butter and bread or beans in a tortilla or um, bean dip in a corn chip, um, those things together will give you a complete protein, which means all of your essential amino acids, just as if you ate an animal product. All animal products have all eight essential amino acids that humans need to survive. Uh, so beans are a great source of that. Another issue is with eating all of that fiber, there are some smaller fibers called oligosaccharides, and they are fibers that are between three and eight unit starches long. We cannot digest them, but the bacteria in our gut can. And so that's where the song, song comes from. Beans, beans, the musical fruit, the more you eat, the more you toot. The more you toot, the better you feel, so eat some beans with every meal. 
hilarious. I was singing that even when I was a young child, my mom taught it to me, but you don't actually need to toot when you eat beans. There's a few different ways to handle it. One, you can eat beans more frequently. Your body gets used to these oligosaccharides and they don't create so much gas. Um, another way to do it, some people are affected by this more than others based on their gut flora, the uh, bacteria that live in our digestive systems that are required to be there. Um, the better family that you have down there, the healthier you will be. So um, when you eat beans, it actually feeds them, which is a good thing, but some of the byproducts of them consuming the fibers from beans are carbon dioxide and methane. So in order to reduce those, what you can do is get a product called Beano. Um, that's the brand name product, but right next to it on the shelf at the pharmacy, it's over the counter. You can just get it, you know, it's right there in the sort of digestive aids um, by your anti, uh, like laxatives and, um, you know, all, all kinds of stomach stuff. Um, right next to it will be the store brand and it's exactly the same. And what it is, what Beano is, is it contains vegetable enzymes. So if you're about to eat beans or sometimes people will eat bell peppers or onions and it gives them a lot of gas or flatulence, um, you can prevent that by eating these vegetable enzymes with your first bite. So when you take your first bite of beans, you pop one of these Beano vegetable um, enzyme pills, you chew it up with your first bite of food, and that goes down in your digestive tract and gives you the enzyme to break apart those oligosaccharides so that when you're, when they get down to those happy little gut flora, those um, chains are already broken apart. So your gut flora will not create the carbon dioxide and methane that they normally would if you did not have those vegetable enzymes with your first bite. Now, if you've already eaten beans, and you're currently experiencing gas, there are other products that you would take like um, Gas X or uh, there's, there's a bunch of them out there and that's just a brand name, but there's um, different kinds of products that you could take once you have gas, Beano won't help you at that point. It's really kind of a preventative rather than uh, an intervention at that point. So just know that those products are on the market. If you usually don't eat beans because you don't want to be embarrassing, um, just put a little, one of those little things in your purse wherever you go. And, uh, or if you know you're going to go out and have um, a certain kind of food, a cuisine somewhere that you know is probably going to have beans in it, um, or you're going over to someone's house and you don't know what they're going to serve you and you don't want to be embarrassing, put some of that in your pocket and you will be fine. Also, it's harmless. You can just eat it. And it's, you know, it, all it does is break apart those oligosaccharides in any of the foods that you eat. So um, just so you know, and you have that in your toolbox for the future. Okay. Let's talk um, a little bit about beans toxicity. So a lot of people don't know this, but if you don't cook beans completely, they can actually be toxic to you. There is a chemical in them called phytohemagglutinin. And um, you can disable this toxin by just boiling beans for 10 minutes. So pre-soaked beans for 10 minutes. A canned bean, they've already been boiled for hours. So you don't have to worry about this with a canned bean, but with a raw bean, if you're going to soak it overnight and then cook it, you need to make sure that you bring the beans to a boil or a low simmer. If you're cooking them on the stovetop, this is obviously going to happen. But often where people have a sickness from beans, um, this is going to happen when you put them in a crock pot and the, the temperature, if it's on low, say you put some beans in a crock pot, you go to work for the day, you come back eight hours later and the beans never came to a boil, you could end up getting sick. Um, it won't kill you, it just um, might feel for about four hours like you're gonna die because um, basically it causes vomiting and diarrhea. So um, you'll think you have food poisoning and actually you do because it is a toxin, but all you have to do is boil the beans for 10 minutes. Once they're cooked, and you're good to go. So um, so just so you know that some beans have more, some have less. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through um, some of our beans here that we're gonna show you today. So if you're gonna cultivate beans, if you wanna grow beans, um, you know, you can do that. Uh, you're going to put your beans in about the time you put in your tomatoes. We talked about peas a couple of weeks ago. Those don't mind a little frost on them. They can go in in late February and they're fine if they get a little frost on them. Bean plants are not frost tolerant at all. They like it warm. They like warm soil temperatures of like 65 degrees or above. So about the time that you're going to put your tomatoes and peppers in, um, go ahead and throw your beans in and uh, and they'll be happy as a clam. So uh, bush beans are a modern variety, but most beans used to grow on poles. So when you buy bean seeds to grow, it will tell you 
pole bean or bush bean. A bush bean is a little tiny plant about this big and most of the beans come ripe at the same time. And that's kind of nice, you know, you can plant every couple of weeks, you can plant beans and then you can just harvest from two or three bushes at a time to feed your family. A pole bean grows tall, 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 tall. It needs a trellis and the beans start to ripen at the bottom first and they ripen all the way to the top. You do get more beans off of a pole plant than you do a bush plant. However, uh, you know, sometimes it's not always convenient. You may not have a trellis and you just want to throw a few beans in. Um, you know, if you've got a really tall, beautiful um, pepper plant or and you just have a little bit of space here and there, you can tuck little bean plants around and they grow really easily. You don't need to stake them and they only need to be four inches apart. So you can really get a lot of food out of a very, like if you put them in a four inch grid, you get a lot of food out of a small space. So just something to keep in mind. One of my favorite things, because I grew up in the Southwest and the common bean group actually originated in Mesoamerica, which is like Mexico and Central America, um, Aztecs, Mayans, things like that. Um, th those, uh, and Incas, those um, communities, civilizations, they grew a lot of beans, they cultivated beans. Um, and they used a format called the Three Sisters. And I just love this, it's a beautiful way to grow. Um, you grow a little block of corn, and then that's the pole for the pole beans. And then you put beans at the base of the corn and the corn will, I mean, the, the beans will grow up the corn pole. And then you also put in squash at the bottom and the squash will grow across the bottom uh, around the corn and the bean plants and it shades out any weeds. So it's a great way for uh, to use one spot and get a lot of food out of one spot. Also, uh, corn is a very hungry plant. It needs a lot of nitrogen and you've got rhizobia feeding bean plants right there at the base of the corn. So it's just a great symbiotic way for plants to grow together. Um, in a small space. You don't need separate fields for it. You can grow them all in one spot. So let's get into a few different kinds of beans. Um, uh, beans are one of these things that um, are very inexpensive and easy to cook once you know how to do it. And so having lots of dry ones around um, is a great thing to have. And I have what, a little bean museum I want to show you that's part of our collection at the food lab um, so that as we're um, you know, doing classes and things. We have a class called Meet Your Beans and we have people try to guess what all these beans are. So this one, you don't have to guess today, I'm gonna tell you all about it. So this one is called a fava bean. And it's a real big, also known as a broad bean. And this is one of the oldest cultivated beans. And this one has been cultivated in the Middle East for so long, they can't even find out, like they can't even figure out like exactly how long ago it was because it's been cultivated for so long. Um, not everybody can eat fava beans. Fava beans, um, there are some people with certain genetics that can't really digest these and it can make them ill. So, um, you know, they're not also very popular either. If you've ever gotten to grow fava beans, they grow much different than a bush bean or a, or a pole bean. Um, they actually grow in this stalk with a big, beautiful purple flower on it. It is so gorgeous. So if you don't know if you can eat them, just grow them for the flowers. They're very easy to grow. You don't need to stake them and they're, they're wonderful. Um, Here's another one that was developed in the Middle East, is cultivated in the Middle East, and it's chickpeas, also known as garbanzo beans. So the reason you call them chickpeas is if you look at each individual bean, it looks like a tiny little chick's head. If you've ever seen an, a day old chick, they've got this sweet little head with a little beak on it. That's what chickpeas look like. So that's why they call them chickpeas. And this is very popular in um, Mediterranean cuisine, but primarily Middle Eastern cuisine because this was domesticated in the Middle East thousands of years ago. And so um, you can soak these beans. If you've ever had falafel, that's what this is made out of hummus. That's what chickpeas, chickpeas are made into those dishes. Um, so you'll find this a lot. They're ubiquitous in, in Mediterranean cuisines. You're gonna find chickpeas all over the place. Very easy to cook, very delicious, um, very uh, fibrous and good and like earthy. Um, I love chickpeas. So, oh, if you buy beans in a can, remember to rinse your beans because up to half of the sodium in the bean can can be washed off of the beans. Yet they have to put sodium in canned food in order to keep the can, I mean, the food in the can from disintegrating. So it also adds flavor and it's a preservative, but you wanna make sure not to just throw beans into a salad. You wanna rinse them in a colander first and get most of that sodium off of there. Okay, let's move over and do another category of beans. These are the crowder pea 
family. So um, black eyed peas, we call them peas, but they're really beans. Um, this is a, also some that were um, developed thousands or uh, domesticated thousands of years ago, but Crowder peas and black eyed peas, they actually grow on a um, they grow on a, a on a pole and they have a very long pod. And when you open up the pod, all the beans are just real close together diagonally. And that's why they call them Crowder peas. They're very popular here in the American South, um, but also they are popular. Uh, they were domesticated in Africa. So um, they grow in very dry, arid regions. And it's a way that people can have a very rich protein diet over there without having to come up with animal foods. So um, this is a really wonderful one. And here in the South, pretty much everywhere in America, but definitely here in the South, it is tradition on New Year's Day to eat black eyed peas with greens so that you will have a rich year um, because uh, the black eyed peas, they represent uh, coins and the greens represent money. So represent uh, dollar bills. So I have a tradition in my family where we eat these with greens every New Year's Day because you know, hey, it couldn't hurt. All right, let's move into the common beans. These everybody is familiar with because these are the ones that primarily people know the most. Um, these beans were the ones that were uh, uh, that were developed, um, that were domesticated in Central America and Mesoamerica. So um, everybody knows the pinto bean. This is very common. It's called a pinto bean because it's painted and that's pinto is painted. So this is a pinto bean. And uh, this is actually my favorite bean because I grew up in the American Southwest. This is home to me. So I always have at least five, five pounds put back in the house. And then when I cook beans, I cook a big pot of beans, even though there's only two of us in the house and I freeze them in, um, in like one pound containers. And then I have fresh cooked beans anytime I want. Um, this is where when you eat refried beans, this is what they're made out of. So um, a kidney bean, we were talking about that phytohemagglutinin, kidney beans and black beans have the most phytohemagglutinin. So make sure when you cook these that you bring them to a boil for at least 10 minutes. Um, if you simmer them on the stovetop, you're good to go. It's just if you're gonna cook them in a crock pot. People say never cook them in a crock pot. You can cook them in a crock pot. Just make sure, put them on the stove and bring them to a boil. Or once they're cooked, salt them and crank that heat to high until they boil for 10 minutes and you're good to go. So kidney beans, they're shaped like a kidney, which is why they call them that. Um, Spanish pink beans are just another variety, a smaller variety of kidney beans. And all of the colors that we're looking at here, all the colors are phytochemicals and they're actually very powerful antioxidants that we consume um, that actually fight the signs of aging and repair a lot of body processes. You know, um, your body just for entropy, like breathing actually causes um, reactive oxygen species to, um, you know, oxidants to bounce around in your body and wreak havoc. So living causes you to age. So anti-aging things, you don't need to spend a lot of money on them. You can eat fruits and vegetables with lots of different colors. And there are lots of antioxidants um, in the colors of fruits and vegetables. So another one that I love um, is this is a kind of pinto bean. It's called a yellow eye bean. Um, they're so beautiful to look at, but when you cook them, this color doesn't stay. I really wish it did. It would be really wonderful if it did, but just like a pinto bean is kind of a plain brown, it's beautiful to start, but then it, the colors kind of mix together. Same with these, but aren't they gorgeous? It's a, it's a common bean. Okay, so this one is a navy bean. A cannellini bean is similar. It's like an Italian variety of a white common bean. The reason they call this a navy bean is because in the U.S. Navy during World War II, this was supplemental food for the U.S. Navy. They ate beans all the time. Very cheap, plant-based, healthy protein um, to keep soldiers healthy. And um, also when you are on a ship for months at a time and you're not coming into port, this is protein that requires no refrigeration. So this was served with every meal. If you've ever had baked beans, this is the bean that they use. Um, or if you've ever had English cuisine, um, and you have beans on toast in a proper full English breakfast, this is the bean that they use when they do baked beans. Okay, so I love this. Oh, the other one, small red beans, black beans, we all know those. Black beans are really popular in Cuba. Um, you'll see this a lot in Cuban cuisine. Um, Miami, you'll eat a lot of these beans. When you go into Cuban food or a Peruvian food, a lot of times you're gonna have black beans and rice together, sometimes rice and coconut, but you'll always have black beans. These have kind of a tough skin on them. They're not exactly my favorite. I like to overcook these until they burst so that the skin is much softer. But this black color is rare in our diet. So it's a good idea to 
to eat black foods, as long as they're naturally occurring black foods, um, it's a rare color um, that we get in our diet. So um, definitely enjoy them. Uh, okay, so real quick, two more categories because I know we got questions. I wanted to show you beans that have developed in East Asia. So this is the mung bean and this is the red bean, also called an adzuki bean or a red mung bean. And they're real small and they sprout very easily. So you can actually sprout these beans. Um, and if you've ever gone to any American Asian cuisine and you see those long, thin bean sprouts, those are mung bean sprouts. So you can actually do them yourself at home. You can sprout any bean and it will make it more digestible. Um, you actually just take a large mason jar and you put a, a, the ring on it with a net over the top. Make sure your drain board and your kitchen is spotless if you are going to sprout anything because sprouts are, once they sprout, can become a very dangerous food if your kitchen is dirty, if you contaminate them. So only handle them with washed hands and you're going to soak, you're only going to fill it maybe a quarter full in that quart jar. You're going to soak them overnight. You're going to dump the water out and three times a day, you're going to gently wash your beans, fill it with water, give them a little swish, drain them very gently. Because as soon as that little germination tail comes out, that little sprout, if you shake them and you break one off, they can die and grow bacteria. Your goal is to never break the tail off a bean. And then you turn them over and you drain them and you let them sit upside down in your drain board while you're at work and whatnot, but wash them two to three times a day and you're good. So normally what I do, I sprout stuff all the time and I just cook them before I serve them. That way you never have to worry about um, any kind of bacteria in it, just cook them. So whenever I bring home those bean sprouts from, uh, from the store, um, I just cook them and then I know that they're always safe. So um, there was an outbreak, you know, the, in the 80s when us uh, what were they alfalfa sprouts were real popular you used to buy them all the time in the grocery store 80s and 90s are a very popular food um they are actually considered like a very hazardous food because it's so easy to grow bacteria in them um so lentils the last category um these are very popular throughout the world um but these are some of the easiest things and the most delicious things to sprout they take about three days to sprout um, or three days until they're done you soak them you rinse them for a couple of days and then you when you, if you put a little oil in a pan and you toast these, like just fry them real quick, they're so nutty and delicious. Oh, they're wonderful on salads. They're wonderful just by themselves. Um, I really enjoy them. I wanted to show you these. These are black beluga lentils. They're expensive, but they're fun. Um, you know, these are like a dollar a pound, these green lentils. You can also get French green lentils that are really beautiful as well. They're kind of a darker, kind of like almost aqua green. Um, these are a black beluga lentil and they're easy to sprout. And I just think, think they call them beluga because it looks like beluga caviar. So they can call charge $10 a pound for them. Sometimes I'll buy them and eat them, but I always have these lentils on hand. These are great because you don't have to think ahead. If you come home and you're like, oh man, I don't have any proteins in the fridge for the kids. These take 25 minutes to cook maybe 30 minutes. You don't have to pre-soak them and cook them for two hours. Um, you just, uh, you know, fry an onion in a pan, throw some of these in and fry these up with them, put a little garlic, whatever spices or fresh herbs that you want, and put three times the water as the amount of, of lentils. Cover it, reduce the heat to a simmer, 25, 30 minutes, you got lentils on the table. So, okay, well, why don't we go ahead and turn it over for questions, because um, I could talk about beans all day. So, Please ask me questions about beans or any other thing that you comes to mind about food. All right, we have a lot of questions today. So first one, you. can you grow pole beans to go downward instead of upward? So that I guess they're hanging. Okay, so you could try, but here's the thing. All plants have, all plants want to grow upwards. So you know that like topsy-turvy tomato thing as seen on TV and it shows this beautiful, perfectly hanging tomato plant, that is staged. A tomato plant will grow out of that and it will start to try to grow upwards. It will maybe break off because it has too much fruit, but all plants, when they cut, if you try to hang them upside down, they want to grow upwards. In fact, and I, this is great. I remember this because I learned it when I was in like a sophomore in high school, because my dad sent me to women in science and engineering. And I hung out with a horticultural research scientist all day, this woman, and she brought me to the lab and they were doing, they were messing with the genetics of plants to try to get them to grow straight out out of the wall instead of growing up and she taught me all about that in plants so you could try but they're just going to try to grow upward 
All right, foiled again. Thank you. Um, all right, we have what was the Navy being called before the Navy began using it so much? Probably just a common white bean, white beans, probably. Cannellini beans are very similar. They're considered a different bean. They're the same species, but a different bean. I don't know, but I'm sure it was some common white bean. I mean, they call this one the mortgage lifter, and it's just like a lima bean, but they call it a mortgage lifter because anything that if you see a tomato or a bean or anything called a mortgage lifter, it means that the farmer had a mortgage on his land and grew that crop and it was so productive and they had a bumper crop that they were actually able to pay off their mortgage so mortgage lifting beans very didn't have cool but. very cool <laughs> okay i've got another one the sprouts i see for sale in the grocery store always look bleak what is the shelf life of sprouts when you do it yourself at home just a few days really so it depends on what you're sprouting it depends on what you're sprouting so the longer you let them grow in that more kind of like juicy delicious sprout that you get the longer those get the less of a life that they have because you put them in the fridge and they're still growing kind of slowly so if you want really fresh gorgeous bean sprouts go to an asian grocery because they're the turnover is so much higher that you're going to get them you're going to get a huge bag for a dollar and they're going to last for days now in order to make anything juicy like that last and i'll say this for lettuce for anything open up the bag tuck a paper towel into one side of it and lay it on its side so that any extra moisture is being wicked up by the paper towel. You can even put one on either side. It's just that make sure your family can still see what's in there. Otherwise they won't look at it and they won't eat it. So that's why I say put it and, and let a little air in there and it's gonna make a big difference. You might get another couple of days out of them. Great. Um, oh, dig to the back. If there's a couple of bleak ones in the front, I do this with milk. I do it with cheeses. I always reach to the back. Bread, always. If you want to know, if you can't find the date on bread, pull the bread. Some of, the, some of them have shelves, but reach back to the bread. And if it's got a different color tab, if you've got yellow, 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 blue, blue is newer because they always, you know, first in, first out. And even if you can't see the date on it, that's the code to the baker delivery guy that that's, that was Tuesday's crop instead of, you know, Anyway, go on. More That's more. great. That's great. Um, okay, I have a question about different types of fiber. So is the fiber in salads different than the fiber in beans? No. So, well, yes. Okay, it's complicated and we could talk for hours about fiber. All right, so there's soluble fibers and insoluble fibers. Insoluble fibers are the ones, I mean, they all feed your gut flora and you wanna do that. You wanna feed those good bacteria. Um, but the soluble fibers are the ones that are gooey. Like when you break open an aloe vera or you break open an okra, those real gooey ones, your gut flora loves those. Um, and those are more like, um, like it's hard to describe it, like almost like the blood of plants in a way. They do a lot of biological processes and, and uh, increase the turgor of a plant, the water absorption, absorptive ability of a plant. Um, but the indigestible fibers are the structural fibers of a plant. The ones, you know, the ribs on a, you know, a really good example is when you peel that string off of a celery, that is an insoluble fiber. So all plants have that. Some of them have more than others in one category or another, but they all have both and they're all good for you. Okay, I have a, a topical question. What should we do about the freeze warning in some areas tonight? Some of you put your tomatoes in too early. I told you April 15th is too early. First weekend in May. <laughs> Gotta go out there and cover everything. Just assume it needs to be covered. If it wasn't growing over the winter or you couldn't put it in in February, if you put anything that makes a fruit, a tomato, an eggplant, a pepper, a bean, any of that, if any of that's in the ground right now, go outside and say, sorry, sorry, little plants. I love you. Nighty night and you go ahead and cover them. So it's not gonna rain, it's just gonna be a snap of cold. It'll be fine. It's just, it's gonna cool down your soil temperatures and that makes the plant sad. So just go ahead and cover them up, let it be sunny. And then as the sun starts to go down, cover them up and then you'll be fine, you'll be fine. Um, but it just slows their growth and they're not happy. And, but they'll rebound once we have a few warm days, you'll be all right. <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I think we are out, I think we could have a, time for one more question if someone wanted to, to raise their hand and unmute themselves. Uh -huh. Any brave souls? One of these days, Sherilyn, one of these days. <laughs> <What's up? laughs> All right, well, I guess we're out of questions um, and out of time. We're at 1.30, so thank you. This has thank been awesome. You.